Hello, I'm Carl Baldassar, and today we're going to be talking about The Lemon Song, which is the third track on the first side of the album Led Zeppelin II, which was released in 1969. It's a great piece of music, an incredible piece of studio improvisation, and a whole lot of fun to try to figure out on the guitar. And I've been looking at it now recently. I remember hearing it for the first time when I was 12 years old and was just completely mystified by it. Also, the rather naughty lyrics, which was uh, somewhat verboten in my household. But uh, nonetheless, it still was an amazing piece of music. And um, as I've recently gone back and to look at it, um, I found so many little subtleties that are going on that I wanted to share some insights with you. So let's take a look. So we'll start by looking at the, uh, the, main, the main riff or the main verse of the, of the song. And I should say before we start that uh, the piece was written by uh, Howlin' Wolf. And, um, and Led Zeppelin you know, grew up listening to the great American blues artists and they absolutely immersed themselves in, in all of that music. And then they really created some amazing innovations on top of standing on the shoulders of those great American blues artists, uh, none the least of which would have been Howlin' Wolf and also the guitar player on this track originally with Howlin' Wolf was a fellow named Hubert Sumlin, I believe it was. And those guitar figures that he put out are the ones that Jimmy Page largely used really literally through the whole piece. So let's take a look at the, uh, the, opening, the opening riff figure, which is uh, this great sort of walking blues line. And that figure, uh, I guess the one thing that when I started looking at this again, I, I kind of realized that there's two voices to it that there's this low voice, the walking from the low E string. And then there's the high droning B part, which is. So it's, a, it's kind of a duet, there's two voices to it. Um, and as I was thinking about it, I realized that Jimmy Page is actually treating it as two unique voices. They're not getting the same sort of treatment with his right hand on this. And what I mean by that, is that the low voice is the primary voice. It's the lead singer of that duet. And he's doing that, you can tell that because he puts a little bit of you know, expression on, a little bit of swagger to it as he gets up to the B, watch. You know, little swipes and swirls that he does the whole song on that. Where the B, the open droning piece, the second voice, sort of the support voice, is really sort of laying back. And in fact, it doesn't even come in on the first beat. It actually comes in on the second beat, or the second um, 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 note, I should say. So it's, there it is. And then it actually doesn't play on the last note. So it's only in for a couple of the notes. Here it is, here it is and gone there, okay? So it's a support uh, tone. Um, I've, I've heard people actually play this with an open B and open E. It certainly rounds out the sound of it, but I don't have any evidence that that was what Jimmy Page was doing uh, in the studio on that version of it. He just ha simply has it as a, a two note sort of duo going on at the same time. The other thing that I notice about that riff is that it's really quite fast, much faster than you think. I think it's clocking in at around 88 BPM, um, and it's super, super bouncy. And as you'll, if you've looked at any of my videos so far, you'll notice that I'm reminding everybody that Led Zeppelin is absolutely a big band swinging band, and they do it on this riff as well. Um, but you can hear it uh, in terms of the tempo. It's you know 88, so it's probably like a yeah, it's pretty peppy, but it, it, because it's bluesy, it kind of sounds like it's sort of lumbering, but it actually is not. It's moving pretty quick. And the other thing that I noticed about the riff is just how there's a bit of an homage to Jimi Hendrix in the riff because of the chord that's being played at the end of the riff. Yeah. That chord, so it was 1969 when 
Jimmy and the band did this. I mean, Hendrix would have still been in his prime at that time. And this is a very Jimi Hendrix chord, this E7 sharp nine. I mean, he really, really made that chord strike out, this altered seventh chord. And uh, I don't think there's um, any uh, reason to think that Jimmy Page wouldn't have been really admiring Jimi Hendrix. I mean, he spent some time in London, Hendrix did. And I think all of the, the guitar players from that part of England uh, were really, really enthralled when Hendrix broke on the scene there. Uh, so I actually hear in this song, here's a little treasure hunt for you. I actually hear th this little support fill that's being done in the middle of the track when it's uh, John Paul Jones improvising the bass and uh, Robert Plant's doing the kind of call and response, great vocals there, but I hear this in there too. You can go find that, but to me, I hear that, and I'm thinking, oh, that's just like purple haze, right? And then when I realize that he's also playing the the seventh sharp nine chords, I, I know that there's probably an homage to, to Hendrix in this whole thing as well. And then the last thing I'm going to point out on the main riff is that um, he's actually, there's this major sort of quality to it, but yet it's this blues song, so there, it creates a little bit of interesting tension to me, because he's hitting an E, and then he goes to a G sharp, so I got a major third going there, and then... So it's interesting to me that you have this blues song, but there's this major third tonality, a major chord tonality. I think it's part of the kind of sort of the the the, uh, the push and pull of the texture of the whole thing. Uh, and the other uh, thing I forgot to mention was on the on the Hendrix chord. Page is actually not always emphasizing the sharp nine, the high note here. He kind of rocks his hand a little bit, and sometimes he'll give you more of just the, the dominant seventh feel, and other times he'll give you the sharp nine. You know, so it's just sort of uh, capricious how he does it. There's no one consistent way. There's something to think about. The colors change, and uh, and you know, we can you can think about it as you're listening to it or as you're playing it. That you know, it's it's good to have a little bit of variety in there. Uh, when the when the riff moves to A. Uh, one of my favorite moments happened. It's a quintessential Jimmy Page. It's going to be uh, Jimmy Page's bend. So he's going into the A. So when Page does these big bends, a whole step bend on the low string. Very cool. And he sets it up with kind of a clenched and, and staccato A right before it. So it's <laughs> stopping him. And uh, I just played the transition into the, uh, the, 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 uh, the B7 chords and that little syncopated part, which is also very Zeppelin y lots of syncopations and gives it a nice bounce and kind of just keeps the concept of the swing thing that's happening throughout it. Complementing the main riff of the piece are the fills that Jimmy Page adds to kind of round it all out. So he has these wonderful sort of pull-off things. He's <laughs> those little pull-offs and those those little kind of little slashy chords I mean they're just so quintessential Jimmy Page and, <laughs> and uh, they kind of just blow your mind when you first hear them but um, they're actually not that complicated what makes them hard is that they go by so fast and you think there's like more notes involved than there really are so my suggestion on that is that you know if something sounds really complicated or a little too you know too fast you might put in too many notes but this particular uh, it's not that difficult but it is amazing when he flies it in there like that and the same with the other little stabs and little pull-offs that he's doing so those little decorations and ornaments when together with a riff you know break the monotony of it and you know have a little bit of flash and tinsel for you as well and now we're going to turn our attention to the, the second half of the song, or the, the B part of the song, shall we call it, the up-tempo piece, which really, it cranks up in tempo almost twice as fast as the first part. And that's the part that I did at the introduction um, uh, to this video. And it is such 
an energetic, amazing piece to play. And it's so fun, and it actually are the same figures that on another great song on the album. And let me show you. So when they go to the, uh, the up-tempo part of the piece, you get these figures. Um, and if that sounds familiar, it should, because if you see what he's doing, those are the major and minor six that are used so frequently uh, by blues people, but also Jimmy Page. Remember this from Heartbreaker? It's the same thing here on, this, on the up-tempo part of Lemon Song. He's just adding different sort of rhythms to it. So it's the same thing. It's majors and minor sixes all along. So I, I find it um, not unusual, you know, where music is a language and you have vocabulary and but you can use the same words in different sentences with different syntax and get different meanings with it. And it's the same thing for all musicians who have just a language and uh, they're creating sentences with it. And, and Jimmy Page was doing the same thing with, the, with those major and minor six figures. Um, the other piece of that uh, up-tempo part that I, I enjoyed um, figuring out, because it's just, it, it just feels so good under your fingers are these little dominant seventh triads that he does to wrap up that up-tempo piece where he's hitting these it's this turnaround of these little dominant seventh figures and they're really fun to play and they lay on your fingers really really nice you know and you've got your root your third and your seven so they're really efficient little chords there's no extra nonsense in there and uh, you know They just feel so great to play, and um, they're really useful to know. And uh, again, he's um, setting up with a cadence, because we end up on B, B7, back to E. So there's always sort of this kind of uh, pointing and leading that's, that's done by great musicians and in all great songwriting and music writing, if you will. It's just absolutely kind of a leading, pointing sort of gestures that... Um, I think uh, make, make it feel relatable and complete. And the last thing I want to point out in this video is um, uh, I like to look at the very final statements in, in, in how a piece of music is closed out, the, the, the final utterance, if you will. Sometimes the ending of a piece can be an entire coda and it can have lots of sub little dramas going on and it ultimately winds up you know, with the final statement. And sometime in the case of the Lemon Song, it's literally just one chord is the final statement. And it's really quite a shocking little statement and you might not even pay attention to it. Um, there's a great flurry of notes before it, but this last chord is quite stunning to me. And it's part of the drama, I think, that's in the song. And where he places the chord with the lyric, he's saying, uh, Robert Plant is singing, Killin' Floor. And on the word floor, something really remarkable happens to the music. So, as you know, the piece is kind of centering on this E. Everything is centering on this E tonality. And you go this entire journey with them from the, from the, uh, the you know, the, the mid-tempo to the up-tempo, back to the mid-tempo, the whole kind of interlude, and, but it's all centered around E. And then you get to the last chord of the song. He's come, he comes out of these really beautiful little figures. He's I'm gonna leave my children down on this killing floor. You get that chord, right? And it's so deliberate and so effective to me. I mean, that's a heavy concept, the killing floor. And you get that chord, and that chord is really, really disturbed. It's just unsettled. Uh, for maybe musicians out there, if I, if I play you that, you might know what that chord is. I'm sure you do. But people that aren't musicians, and you hear that chord, doesn't 
doesn't sound very settled. It sounds sort of uncertain. It's really not a great um, kind of, it sounds like it's a transition that something's happening right there. And that chord is a augmented chord, but the key to that is that he has it with an E flat root. Why is that important? Because you've just had three or four or five minutes, I don't know how long the song is, of E tonality just driven to you, right? And then he gets to this, I'm gonna leave my chillin' down on the killin' floor. He drops it from E. That dramatic half-step shift uh, is so powerful right there, and you could maybe just chuck it off and not notice it, but I would encourage you to listen to it. It's so deliberate, it's so potent, it fits that lyric right there. It's part of the drama in music. And it's just also sort of a reminder um, of the power of a half a step, whether it's a half a step below or half a step above. I mean, that half step, that minor second, really communicates a lot in music. And it's a, it's a, it's a technique that has tremendous effect. So the fact that he used it right there, I think um, it makes, makes the whole journey worthwhile. I'll leave you with this quote. Um, there was a great conductor. Mm, he, was, he was active in the 60s and 70s and, and 80s. His name was uh, Sergei Celibidaci. He was Romanian and he was an extraordinary philosophical conductor. He's, he's really worth digging into on the internet. I stumbled across him uh, a few years ago. And he, had, he's, he said so many amazing things and he's, he has such an interesting take on music. Uh, and I may be belaboring the point, but I, I love this concept and it sort of plays out here and it'll play out in a lot of other episodes I'll do. And that is that he said that, you know you've come to the end of a piece of music when the ending fulfills the promise of the beginning. And that is such a potent statement. And I think for anybody who's a songwriter or an artist or a composer, whatever you'd call yourself, you know, your, your audience, your counterparties of human beings listening to your music, you almost have a duty to try to make the journey worth their time. And there's one more level to that, that you want that concluding statement or coda or whatever it's gonna be, final movement even, that uh, I think it's a worthwhile and noble goal to make sure that that ending fulfills the promise of the beginning. And sometimes we get a little bit lazy when we're writing and we sort of get to the end and it's sort of, you know, we're not, we're not giving it our, our, our all. And um, I would much rather have a, a, a piece be great than a piece be finished. And sometimes it requires patience. But I belabor the point, a little composer talk right there. But I think that E flat augmented chord at the end of the Lemon Song is a brilliant choice by Jimmy Page and Led Zeppelin. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I'm Carl Baldessar.